This is the second part of the design pressure measurement video. So where we left off, we were starting to talk about pressures, duct pressures, and other pressure effects in buildings. So now let's talk about pressure measurements. Because as I said, if you don't measure, you don't know. So several pressure measurements exist in this world. They all measure the same things. The force of air with regards to something else. Okay, in other words, we work on right angles. Okay, so the force of something with regards to something else. Put this into context. The pressure in a building is measured with regards to the pressure outside the building. The pressure in ductwork is measured with regards or in comparison to the pressure in the building, and so on and so forth. You always measure pressure in one area with regards to the pressure in something else. So static pressure is the outwards force of air in an object. Could be a house, balloon, ductwork. Okay, so down here on the right corner, I have a piece of ductwork. The static pressure is the measurement of the pressure that's coming out against the sides of the ductwork. Okay, and again, it's measured in water column. So the outward force of air is static pressure. Velocity pressure, and that's blocking the text a little bit, but velocity pressure is the pressure of the air moving in the duct. Okay, so the air, so my airstream is moving here. Velocity pressure is the air, the pressure of the air moving in the ductwork. It's not the outwards pressure. It's the pressure of the airstream itself. Velocity pressure can be calculated and also used to calculate cubic CFM, which is the amount of air we're moving. So we calculate the velocity, we calculate the area of the duct, and we can calculate the CFM. So the total static pressure is the combination of the duct static pressure and the velocity pressure. So again, we have three pressure readings. We have static pressure, that's the outward force. We have velocity pressure, that's just the air moving inside the duct. And we have total pressure, which is the combination of duct static pressure and velocity pressure. The pitot tube is a device that can measure all of these pressures by using one tube in the ductwork. Okay, so if I put the top portion of this into the ductwork and I connect two to two spots on the outward, it's a double, it's basically a double wall tool. I have static pressure and total pressure. Now again, let's think about this. Velocity pressure is a combination of static pressure in the air moving. Okay, that's my total velocity pressure. So if I subtract static pressure from the total pressure, don't I get the pressure of the velocity or the velocity pressure? So velocity pressure, you can calculate by getting your total pressure, which is easy to measure using a pitot tube, and your static pressure, which again is easy to measure using your pitot tube. So that we take those, uh, take those two measurements, subtract them, and then you get your velocity pressure, which is the pressure of the feed in the duct. Total external static pressure of any device is the pressure in the supply and return ducts added together. So in your supply duct, you have a positive pressure. In your return duct, you have a negative pressure. Take the absolute value, which means you drop the signs. You no longer have a positive and negative, and you add the two numbers together. This total external static pressure is compared to the number on the data plate. If it's over or seriously under, a problem exists. Every device in an HVAC system causes a pressure drop. Okay, causes a drop in static pressure. Every single device... Every pressure drop across every device can be measured. So if I have a filter, an A-coil, a heat exchanger, a bend in the ductwork, a damper, every device that's in the airstream of an HVAC system causes a drop in static pressure. To measure the pressure across a coil, for example, and these two pictures down here, you have an upper picture above the coil, a lower picture, you take the pressure readings on both sides of the coil and subtract the two. That gives you your pressure drop. 
So again, to take a pressure drop on across anything, take take a reading on one side of it, take a reading on the other side of it, subtract the two numbers. Now be very cautious when you're taking when you're making the holes in the ductwork around coils. Do not drill into the hoya coil. Be very sure where you're drilling. Filters can also have a pressure drop. You can get the chart of this from the manufacturers or you can measure it. Every filter has a pressure drop. The pressure drop will be different based on if the filter's new and clean or if the filter is old and used. It's going to have a different pressure drop. Example, the pressure drop on the left side of that, the left hand filter, that's a new filter. It's going to be quite a bit different than the pressure drop on the right side, which is a dirty filter. So I can use pressure sensing tools to do my pressure drops to calculate my whether or not a filter is dirty. We use this pretty frequently in commercial and building controls. If I have a higher than normal pressure drop, my filters are dirty. We need to signal somebody or send a report that the filters need to be changed. We have different filter locations. Okay, we have an upflow furnace, we have a platform, and we have a closet furnace. Your filters are going to be in different locations on this. If you look closely at the picture, there's a filter grill right to the left of the furnace between the filter between the furnace and the ductwork. On a platform or a closet system, my return grills are all on the bottom, and your filter is going to be right above those return grills. You can barely see it. On a horizontal system, the filter is going to be slid into one side of the unit if it's near the unit, or it's going to be mounted in the register grills in a house. Okay, now we're going to switch gears a little bit. We've now talked about pressure and duct work. Let's talk about pressure across houses. We need to be aware that there's several driving pressures across houses. I'm going to come back to this picture a few times. So, the stack effect we've already talked about a couple times. The house acts as a chimney. Hot air rises. Cold air falls. Wind can pressurize one side of a house over another. It can also make draft change become unstable. In other words, if I have wind blowing across a roof, it can blow wind down a chimney and cause furnaces to vent in reverse. Okay? If I have wind coming down a chimney in the wrong way, I could cause a fireplace to reverse. If on the windward side of the house... I'm going to be pushing into openings on the leeward, that's the side that's a, that's on the opposite side of the wind direction. Okay, I'm going to be actually creating a negative pressure. So wind on the outside of a building can actually cause some real issues on the inside of a building. Okay, exhaust fans and combustion venting cause pressure changes. They suck air out of a building. It can depressurize the house. A wood fireplace can remove upwards of 800 CFM, that's 800 cubic feet per minute of air. A dryer using a standard 4-inch vent can remove 106 CFMs of air. That's a lot of air. A dryer runs for usually over an hour. Okay, you're removing over, I mean, you take an hour, that's 60 minutes, so 60 times 106 times 60. Okay, you got to really be aware of how long you're running these appliances for, for. A fireplace, you run for a couple hours at a time in the evening. It's 800 cubic feet per minute that's going out of fireplace chimney. Duct leakage. Duct leakage can pressurize and depressurize houses as well as single zones. A return duct leak in an attic can pressurize a house. A supply duct leak ad at, in the attic can depressurize a house. Combustion air, distribution air, and ventilation air movement are required in very specific amounts for safe, efficient operation of an air conditioning of any HVAC system, not just air conditioning, heating as well. Okay, let me say that again. Combustion air, distribution air, and ventilation air our movement are required in very specific amounts for safe operation of an HVAC system. 
So let's take a look at a couple different types of buildings. Okay, stack effect. Warm air rises. The air leaks out of holes near the top of the structure and leaks in the, at the bottom of the structure. As that warm air rises, my lower portion of the house is going to become a negative pressure and my upper regions of the house is going to be a positive pressure. That can cause my chimneys to my furnaces and water heaters to work in reverse. That's called the building stack effect. Exhaust fans can take all the air out of a house. If 100 CFM of air is taken out of a house, 100 CFM of air must come back into the house. Fireplaces act as large exhaust fans. Again, if there's no place for makeup air, if you don't have proper ventilation, the chimneys work in reverse. That's what we're showing you over here on this really light drawing. Okay, my chimney starts working in reverse and that becomes a source of air through fireplace chimneys or vent chimneys. This is a bad thing. Radon can be pulled up as well as other ground contaminants can be pulled up into a house. So again, exhaust fans, they're required. They can cause a lot of damage if you don't have enough outside air coming in in a controlled manner. Wind. The wind blows against the house. The windward side of the house experiences positive pressures. The leeward side of the house is a negative. Just again, windward. That's the side of the house that's facing the wind. Leeward. That's the side of the house that's not facing the wind. Okay, it creates a negative pressure. Supply duct leakage is actually something really strange. You don't think about it, but if a supply duct, that's the air providing, that's the air going to the rooms from the furnace or the air handler. If it's leaking in an unconditioned space, it forces air out of the ductwork. Well, when air is being forced out of the ductwork, it can pressurize or depressurize a house depending on where it's leaking. If a supply duct is leaking in an attic, it's going to pull all the air out of the house eventually and cause a negative pressure situation. This is a picture of a supply duct leakage. It was buried under insulation. By the way, that's a picture that I took on a call on an insurance claim I went to. People had mold in a house. Okay, you see this is a duct connector. Okay, it's a duct connector between two pieces of ductwork. Someone did not put that connector together properly and then did not tape it properly. So there's holes all over that. That duct work is leaking. Return duct leakage can draw air air from the areas such as crawl spaces, attics, and garages that are contaminated. So if I'm put, pulling air in from those areas, putting it through my air handlers, and it's pushing it into the house. So I can actually overpressurize a house with contaminated air if there's return duct leakage. Now, this is the one that affects most of everybody. It's called closed door effect. This is the one where you may be watching this video at home and say, wow, this is exactly what's happening in my house. Okay, happens quite a lot, especially when I'm actually teaching this in a classroom environment. We at least have one or two students every time I show this PowerPoint and talk about this that all of a sudden they say, yep, that's what's happening. So, okay, so let's think about the average house. If you have one return duct that's in the center of the house, you have one return duct, and then you have supply ducts in just about every room. Those are the small squares. Okay, thinking this through, my biggest area is basically my living room, dining room, kitchen situation if it's an open floor plan. So I have a return duct here. Then I have three bedrooms, four bedrooms, maybe a bathroom. Maybe one of these is an office. Okay, at night, people have a tendency to close the doors of their bedrooms. Okay, so you close the door of your bedroom. Now I have a supply duct, a closed door, and no path for the air to return to the return area. Okay, so we now have, okay, a closed door effect. I've put a closed door across all these different areas. Wow, the pen works. Okay, so now I have my supply ducts in here. These are all supply ducts. Okay. I'm, so they're pushing air into this space. I have a return duct right here. Normally a return has a single slash across it. I have a return duct here. So the only air that is going into the return duct is coming from yeah, the bathroom area because normally people leave that door open 
when they're not using it. And my large pressurized zone out here, okay? So my bedrooms, the air is being pushed in, okay? But it's not going easily back to the return. So it's going to work for a while, but it's only going to work until this room equals the pressure of the air in my ductwork. Okay, which is like normally like you might have 0.5 inch static pressure. Okay, so until the air in the bedroom is pressurized to the same point as the air in the ductwork, I'll continue to heat or cool. But the minute or second that the air pressure meets the air pressure in the room, these areas are no longer heating or cooling properly. So you're going to get to a point where maybe this corner bedroom that has a lot of outside walls, the pressure will equal my bedroom will actually get hot or cold depending on the season I'm in. Okay, because the air is no longer going to circulate properly in this space. Now, several things can be done for this. Okay, you can install a grill that goes, oh, it's installed over the doors that actually allows air to move across here. Well, there's a noise problem. Okay, you get to hear what everyone else is doing if you do this. Okay, the best way to deal with this, and the way it's most often dealt with, people install a single return in every room. Okay, that's the right way to do it. Return in each room instead of this central return situation. That way, every room has air circulation in and out. Again, that's closed door effect. This is really important when we're talking about closed door effect. Okay, when we're talking about comfort, do not install a central return unless you absolutely have to. You want returns in every room or in multiple areas of the house. There's two areas you never put returns in, and that's the kitchen and the bathroom. It's because I don't want to suck grease and odors into the air handlers. The design of distribution systems is based on many calculations which may not take into account such factors as unusual installation practices, winds outside the structure, and humidity. Okay, need to be careful of that because these designs a lot of times do not include these factors. They make a difference. All houses and buildings should have ventilation air. It's required. Ventilation air is required for occupant health, comfort, and fire safety. Ventilation air may be fan-induced into the structure or may be, automatic, may be natural. There's, a, there's an area in every house that has a gas burning or an oil burning or anything with flame. It's called the Combustion Appliance Zone, CAZ. It's a zone in a house where a vented combustion appliance is located. The zone is most critical to maintain in proper pressures. A negative pressure in a combustion appliance zone can spread carbon monoxide. You don't want to do that. Okay, this obviously I took from the building sciences company with permission. But here what we have is we have outside air intake that's coming down into a combustion appliance zone. Someone attempted to do the right thing. They put a dryer vent in the wall, brought in outside air. Well, that's great. But the pipes in this basement were freezing because there's no control on this outside air. Okay, so it became a problem. The water heater, actually, they had major problems with the water heater and everything else. You have to measure, okay? This is what I leave this PowerPoint with, okay? If you do not measure, you do not know. If you do not take static pressure readings and duct pressure readings on every single service call you go to, you're actually guilty of malpractice. Okay, you have to measure. Do not leave a forced air system without taking a supply static pressure and a return static pressure and making sure that it is in line with what the system specs are. If the customer doesn't want to fix it, document it. Have them sign off on it. Document everything, every single time. And by the way, a picture of your measurements is worth a thousand words on a piece of paper. 